Hi everybody, today we're going to be talking about some of our other poultry breeds besides our everyday chickens. Um, so some of those other breeds that are going to be really important or species that are other, really important um, in the industry is turkeys, ducks, geese, and redites. And for these, you're going to really need to be careful of their scientific name because we're not talking about all one species in this case. So for the turkeys, it's Malagris galapavo. For the geese, it's Anser anser domesticus. Ducks are going to vary. There are two different species of ducks. Most of them are one particular species, but then there will be a breed that is another. And then your radites are actually a family of birds, so they all have different species names. And what a radite really is, is a bird that is a larger bird, <clears throat> usually, and doesn't have a keel in their breastbone. So it's a whole family of birds without this keel. This keel is used for balance in both when they're swimming in the water like a duck would or when they're flying. Um, and these are all flightless birds. That's another key thing. So since they don't need to fly, they don't need this keel area in the breastbone. They just have a regular flat breastbone like a lot of our mammals would have. And that's what really sets them apart and puts them in this family together. So that's going to include the ostrich, the emo, and the rhea that we're going to look at. It would also include things like kiwis and cassowaries. Right here, I'm going to have you pause and watch the TED Ed video on why birds can't fly. Go ahead and answer those questions and then come back to this one. So one of the distinguishing features that we're going to see about these different bird species and different breeds is the type of egg that they lay, both the size of that egg, sometimes the shape of the egg. Geese eggs tend to be a little bit more oblong and pointed at the ends. Um, and then also the color of that egg is going to be another important distinguishing factor. And then another aspect of this side of the poultry industry that we haven't talked about yet is the down and feather industry. So you need to know what the difference is between these. Feathers are going to be that outer covering of the bird. It's going to give them a lot of that lift to allow them to fly. It's also going to help trap some air in closer to their body to regulate their temperature. Um, and they are going to be um, really those quilled, longer um, coverings on the bird. So down, on the other hand, you're not probably going to see when you first look at a bird, but if you were to go down underneath their feathers, those are fibers that are found closer to the body, and their job is really mostly just to insulate and keep them warm. So they're going to produce more down in the winter months to do that. Um, there are no quills in the down, so because of that, it's a little bit more desirable for some of the products that we might want to make from it. And some of those could be pillows, comforters, and jackets. Um, feathers can be used in all of those too, but of course, because they have the quills, they're going to be a little bit more coarse, a um, little bit less desirable. Both of these can come from either ducks or geese. Um, geese do tend to produce more down, so they're a little bit more popular for this production. Um, but in either case, this is really going to be a byproduct, um, not a primary product, because at this point, we really only harvest these from animals that are already being harvested for meat. So the duck or the goose would be raised to its maturity for a meat animal, and then as part of that final process, we would harvest the feathers or the down. Um, there used to be some other practices where it would be harvested while they're still alive, but that's really not very ethical, and so the industry really doesn't operate that way anymore. So that wraps up your background information for this week, and we're going to move on and look at a few different types of turkeys that are important in the poultry industry. So the first one is the Beltsville Small White Turkey. And these guys were developed in the 1930s because U.S. consumers wanted a meaty 8 to 15 pound turkey that could feed a family, but could also fit in an apartment sized refrigerator. And they didn't want a turkey with dark pin feathers because the turkeys at the time were larger, they were also a little bit thinner, and they had dark plumage. And that gave a kind of a speckled look to the meat that people weren't really looking for. So this was actually developed at the USDA Research Center in Beltsville, Maryland and they did it by crossing four other turkey breeds. This breed was the most popular during the 1950s, but then it almost went extinct by the 1970s because it wasn't as suitable for restaurants that wanted bigger birds since it is on the smaller side. 
Um, also, we're going to take a look in a second at some of the broad-breasted varieties, and those have a much faster growth rate, makes them much more efficient to farm. However, those broad-breasted white turkeys have to be bred by artificial insemination. These Beltsville turkeys are still able to mate naturally and can still be selectively bred by small-scale producers. This is a lot of times what you're going to see if you buy a heritage breed turkey. It's often going to be a Beltsville small white. Um, it does also come in the slate variety, which is kind of a gray, a mixture of different gray colors. Um, but most of them do have pure white feathers. And they're almost identical to the broad-breasted white in terms of their color and their markings. The big difference is that they're going to be much smaller, much thinner, without that wide breast that the broad-breasted white is going to have. So before we get to that broad-breasted white turkey, we're going to talk about its relative, which is the broad-breasted bronze turkey. And this is the most popular turkey variety for most of American history up until recent years. So this is probably what you think of when you think of what a turkey looks like, but most of your turkeys now probably actually don't look like this. They're probably the white variety instead. It originated in the U.S. during the 1700s from crosses between the domestic turkeys that were brought by colonists to the Americas and the eastern wild turkey. And the coloring really looks pretty similar to what we see in our wild turkeys. Um, and one of the reasons they did this is it introduced that hybrid vigor and that resulted in a larger, healthier, and tamer bird because of those advantages of mixing up those genes. They get their coppery or metallic brown color from their wild ancestors, but they were selectively bred to have shorter legs and shorter keels. And what that basically caused is that these animals are no longer able to breed naturally. So the only way to produce these turkeys is through artificial insemination. These were really popular up until the 1960s, and then at that point, consumers started preferring a larger, cleaner looking turkey with no dark pin feathers. Um, and the industry switched over to mostly broad-breasted white turkeys at this point. But this is still probably what you're thinking of on Thanksgiving when you're picturing your turkey. It's just in reality, your turkey is probably a broad-breasted white turkey instead. So these are the major breed of the U.S. turkey industry, and chances are whenever you're eating turkey, this is what you're eating. Um, these were bred specifically to produce a lot of breast meat because that's what the consumer was after. So again, they can no longer breed naturally because it really kind of throws off their whole body's anatomy um, and their ability to do that. So they must be artificially inseminated. They are bred to grow very large and some of them can exceed 50 pounds at full maturity before they're dressed. Um, and some people feel that the taste and the texture here have been sacrificed for size and that's why heritage birds are still around um, because some people would prefer that original flavor. So now that we've talked turkey, let's talk about our ducks. So the Muscovy duck is the first one that we're going to introduce you to. And these guys are native to the South American jungles and they still live wild there. This is the only domestic duck breed that does not come from mallard ducks. It's a completely different species. So make sure you know its scientific name because of that. They're called musco ducks originally because they ate so many mosquitoes. So that's where that name Muscovy comes from. They're usually kept mainly for insect con control for that reason, or as a dual purpose, insect control and meat duck. And they're particularly helpful controlling flies, grasshoppers, ticks, and mosquitoes. So a lot of times you'll see these on cattle farms where they can reduce the number of flies by 80 to 90%. Um, their most common coloring is actually all white. So like the top ones that you see there, but they also come in a pied color. Um, and that is a mixture of black and white patches. And then they also come in several brown and gray shades as well. Males have a crest at the top of their heads, and that's a section of feathers that they can actually raise up at will. Um, and they'll do that to assert dominance over other males or to impress females. These guys are really excellent at flying, so you do have to clip their wings or they are likely to fly away. They do not quack like other ducks. Instead, they make a hissing sound if they're a male, and the females make a sound called a pip, and it's said to be similar to a flute quickly alternating between the notes F and G. 
Their eggs take longer to hatch than any other duck variety at 35 days, and their meat is 98% fat free. It's also the same color as steak, and it's not as greasy as your typical duck meat. They're extremely friendly and they're known for following you around like a dog. And there is some debate on whether they should be considered ducks or geese or an entirely different type of bird because they are so different than the rest of our ducks. The next duck we're taking a look at is the white pecan duck. And this is also called the American pecan or the Long Island duck. It was developed from Chinese mallard varieties in Great Britain in 1872. And it's the most common type of domesticated duck. And there's a lot more than the two that we're seeing here, but these are the two most likely to encounter. These guys are all white with yellow bills and feet and a vertical posture. And you might notice, you might kind of recognize them because this is your Affleck duck, right? Or your Donald duck um, that has been used as many mascots along the way. Um, they're long, broad, deep, and full-breasted, and they are the fastest growing breed, which makes them an ideal meat duck. So 95% of the duck meat that's sold in the U.S. is Pekin duck. They are known as dual or triple purpose ducks because they're also used for eggs. Duck eggs tend to be very rich um, and sometimes better for desserts than chicken eggs. And they're also used as ornamental ducks or as pets. So if you see a duck, chances are it might be a white Pekin. Moving on to our geese, again, there's many different varieties here. We're just going to look at two of the most popular, most important ones. So this is the Emden goose. This is one of our oldest domestic breeds. We have records of it dating back about 200 years, and it's named after the German town where they may have originated. They also may have had some of these geese that came from Denmark in addition. For, this is the most common goose that's used for commercial production, and that's because of its fast growth rate and its large size. It's nearly twice the weight of a common barnyard goose, and it also has double the feathers of that common barnyard goose. So that's going to be an important byproduct. This is they are about three and a third feet tall at full height and weigh between 20 and 31 pounds. So that's really quite a large bird. Um, and they're generally pure white. Their orange bill has a white tip on the end of it, and that's one way that you can recognize them. They also have blue eyes with red eyelids that go around them, and that is one of the easiest ways to tell them apart from other white geese breeds. The males and females look alike, but the females are smaller and shyer, and these guys are raised for both meat and for goose down. The other breed we're taking a look at here is the Toulouse Goose, and this was named for the French city where it originated. Some types of these geese have a flap of skin called a dewlap that's under their bill. So unlike a cow where it would be down in the breast area, it's, it's just right underneath their bill there. Um, this is the second largest goose breed after the Emden Goose at 21 to 30 pounds on average, and it comes in white gray and buff varieties. Um, so mostly the gray ones are shown here. The plumage is fuller and softer than other geese and often used for down. And this soft, soft plumage doesn't dry out as well as other geese, so they do need to be taken in when it's raining. They can't sit out in the rain. They're a shy, calm, and quiet breed. They don't do well in mixed breed flocks because they tend to be bullied and they also won't move far from their food and water, so they'll stick around um, near you. They have a higher fat content than other breeds and they can gain weight faster. So they were traditionally bred for goose fat to be used in cooking or to lubricate machinery, um, but also for their rich meat. These are also the geese that are bred for foie gras, which is basically a fatty liver that's often used to make pate. But this is kind of associated with a really controversial practice of force feeding. Um, when they're raising foie gras geese, sometimes they will actually put a tube down their throat to feed a high fat and grain mash right into their crop, um, which in a lot of states has been outlawed because it's not ethically sound. This is the most difficult goose breed to raise because of their low fertility, their eggs have a low viability rate, and they also take longer to mature to breeding age and you must carefully manage their nutrition. All right, so now that we've talked about our ducks, turkeys, and geese, let's move on to some of our more exotic poultry breeds, and that is in those in the radite family. 
Um, so the first one that we're going to talk about is the ostrich. And notice with all of these, their scientific names are all going to be a little bit different because these are all separate species that evolved at separate times. So the ostrich is native to Africa and it can reach over 400 pounds and over nine feet high. They can live anywhere from 50 to 70 years um, at a time. Um, and their key feature that you're going to really use to recognize them from other large radites is that they only have two toes. So that's going to be a key thing to look for. They can't fly, just like our other radites, um, and instead they use their wings primarily for communication and for balance when they're running. They can reach top speeds at up to 40 miles per hour. Their males have black and white plumage, where the females are more of this grayish brown color. Um, their head and neck appear bald. They do have some fuzz on there that you can see up close, um, but from far away it's going to look like they're bald. So these are raised for a bunch of different purposes, for their eggs, for their meat, for their feathers, and for leather. So their white-shelled eggs can fetch anywhere from $30 to $50 each, and if they're fertile eggs that could be hatched, they can go for up to $100 each. One egg is the equivalent of 20 large chicken eggs, and most hens will lay somewhere between 40 and 60 of those eggs per year. So you could see how it could be very profitable. Um, the largest of all, these guys are the largest of all bird eggs, um, but they're actually one of the smallest when you compare it to their body size. Proportionally, um, it's pretty small in comparison to the size of an adult ostrich. Hard boiling one egg takes 90 minutes, so that just gives you an idea of how big this is. Ostrich meat is similar in beef, but lower in fat and it usually sends bet sells between $10 and $50 a pound. So again, you can see how that could be very profitable. And ostrich feathers and leather are also in high demand. So ostrich farming is gaining popularity because of that huge potential for profit. Another advantage of these guys is they can tolerate really hot temperatures and they don't need shelter since they're used to living in the African savanna. They do require a five to six foot fence, so that's one of the, your limiting factors. These are considered tamed animals, but they're not truly domesticated. They are very difficult to handle, and they tend to be very standoffish. They have a very strong defensive instinct, because if you think about, they would be fighting off all of these African predators, typically. So the males especially get very territorial during the breeding season, and both genders will guard their nests. The males will mate with multiple females, but they do only form a lifelong partnership with the dominant female. The whole flock of females lays their eggs in one particular nest, and then the dominant hen sits on the nest during the day, and the rooster that is bonded with her sits on the nest at night. Um, so these are not one of the most easy animals to farm, um, but because of the potential to make a lot of money from them, they are becoming more popular. Next on our list is the emu. So again, completely different species, evolved separately from the ostrich. They're not related to each other. So these guys originated in Australia instead, um, and they are considered more of a medium-sized red -eye. They're somewhere between five and six feet high. They weigh up to 150 pounds, so definitely smaller than your ostrich. Another key distinguishing fe feature is if you look at their feet, they have three toes. So that's one way that we can tell them apart easily from that ostrich. Um, and then there's a couple other key features. One is that their feathers part in the middle of their back. So they'll all go one direction on one side and the other direction on the other, which the ostrich feathers don't do. They're also the only bird with a double shafted feather, which means that after the quill, the feather actually splits into two parts. Um, and it has that unique feature that you're not gonna see in any other bird. They also have yellow eyes. So that's another key thing because all of our other radites have brown eyes. And these guys have a black head, which is gonna look a little bit darker than your other radite heads. They also lay dark hunter green colored eggs, where the other radites have a paler color egg, um, and they have pointier bills than your other radites. The males next turn blue in the breeding season, 
So that's one signal that they are ready to breed. Um, and they also have a unique pad on their back. And this basically stores some oil. So this is called emu oil. That has a couple of unique functions. It helps them regulate their body temperature in extreme heat. And it also um, is now in high demand because it's something that traditionally Aborigines used for thousands of years to treat burns and wounds and other skin problems. Um, so it, they are starting to use it in cosmetics and soaps and lotions. And there's a lot of speculation that emu oil may actually be anti-inflammatory. So it's being tested for pharmaceutical use so that it may actually be developed to be used in different skin products um, and as a drug. Um, also, in addition to the high demand emu oil, emu meat has the highest protein content and lowest fat content of any meat of any kind. So that makes it a real nutritional powerhouse but it's also similar in taste and texture to a lean beef. So it's really in demand for that reason. And the leather and eggs are also in high demand, just like with the ostriches. One of the ways that you can tell these emus apart from ostriches, in addition to all of those other qualities, is that they tend to have much more laid back personalities. Um, so that makes them much easier to handle. These guys are a lot more kind of chilled out than your ostrich. Your ostrich is very territorial and defensive all the time. The emus tend to be a little bit more accepting of humans. So they're going to be a little bit easier to farm. And the last species of radite that we're going to look at here is the rhea. So again, these evolved completely separately from the other two, totally different species. Um, and these birds are native to South America, specifically Argentina. So rheas are going to do a little bit better in cold weather than some of your other red-eyed birds. And they would be more suitable for anything you're raising kind of in this area or further north. So these are going to be much smaller than an ostrich, but they're going to look similar in their appearance. The smallest red um, are these rheas, and they are somewhere between 4 and 5 feet high and range between 50 and 80 pounds in size. So still much larger than a duck or a goose, um, but nothing compared to an ostrich. They also have three toes like the emu, but their coloring is very different than the emu. It's gonna be much more ostrich-like. Um, so they're that lighter color head uh, compared to the emus. They also have gray or brown eyes. So that's another way that you can tell them apart from an emu and they have a dark stripe that runs all the way from their beak down their neck and about halfway down their back. So that black stripe is gonna be another way to pick them apart from our other similar birds. They also lay white eggs like an ostrich would, but they're not nearly as large as ostrich eggs. And they would be raised for the same thing, meat, eggs, and leather primarily. They're very hardy and disease resistant, and their feathers are the ones that are commonly used in feather dusters. So a lot of times that will be rhea feathers, not ostrich feathers, since ostrich feathers are so much bigger and um, a little bit more fancy. All right, so that wraps up our other poultry breeds that we're looking at this week. And just make sure that if there's any information you didn't get from these videos, you're going back and researching that. I would start with the Oklahoma State site and go from there. Thanks. Have a great day.